The learning objective of this chapter is to identify basic geological processes that shape the Earth's surface, examine the Earth's climate differences, explore the Earth's natural resources, and describe the bioregions and biodiversity, which is all a part of the framework for understanding human settlement patterns. A lot of what we see above the Earth's surface was formed due to massive geological processes that have occurred below the Earth's surface. These geological processes, including plate tectonics, which have provided the unique character to the Earth's diverse landscapes, and are central for helping us understand the wide array of human activity that occurs around the world. Plate tectonics is a geological theory that Earth's outer layer consists of plates that move very slowly across the surface. These plates move because of a heating process that occurs deep within the mantle. According to plate tectonics theory, large convection cells circulate molten rock in different directions within the mantle. In the crust, the slow movement of the cells drags tectonic plates away from the mid-ocean ridges, resulting in a collision of plates and the convergent plate boundaries. Although the rate of movement differs for each convection cell, in general it is only a few inches per year. Plate tectonic theory is the reason for many of the world's largest mountain ranges, including the Himalayans and the Alpine mountain ranges. However, it does not account for all highlands. Some mountain ranges, such as the Rockies and the Urals, are situated in the middle of the plate. Two possible explanations for their existence are that plate placement could have been, could have been different when they were formed, or these mountains were formed due to a ripple effect caused by plate movement along the boundaries. Please pause the video and click on the link to watch a video on plate tectonics. Be sure to take notes in order to help you answer the question on the next slide. Please pause the video and answer the following. What are three kinds of tectonic plate boundaries and what do they produce from movement? Provide an example for each. In your own words and using the text and video as a guide, be thorough and specific in your answer. This map of the world shows the close relationship between tectonic plate boundaries and the world distribution of earthquakes and volcanoes. Note the so-called Pacific Rim of Fire that includes the eastern coasts of Asia and the western coasts of both North and South America. The San Andreas Fault has long been thought of as a place of convergence of the North American and Pacific plates and was originally formed by two plates colliding. However, in recent years, some geolog geologists believe that this place of convergence is really to the east of the Sierra Nevada mountains. More recently, this fault became a transform fault where, where the eastern edge of the Pacific plate moves laterally northward at a rate of several inches per year, pushing sideways against the North American plate. The photo is of the main fault trace of the San Andreas and the dry Carrizo Plain area halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles in, Calif in the California coast ranges. This area has always been a hot spot of earthquake activity and especially for the two cities. There are several major geological hazards that have had an effect on human activities. They include earthquakes and volcanoes and occur primarily along the plate boundaries. The photo shows Mount Fuji, the highest mountain in Japan, at almost 13,000 feet. This is considered an active volcano and even though its last eruption was in 1708, if this should erupt again, it would severely impact the 36 million inhabitants of Tokyo just 60 miles away. Tsunamis occur when massive earthquakes happen undersea. During an undersea earthquake, the energy produced from the earthquake is pushed up creating a major ripple in the ocean and therefore sending huge waves towards the shore. This photo shows the epic destruction of property along the northeastern coast of Japan that occurred in 2011 when a major 9 point magnitude undersea earthquake generated a tsunami that reached 130 three feet high and traveled six miles inland, causing about 20,000 deaths. This photo shows the volcanic activity common in Iceland because of the divergent tectonic border that bisects the island and the North Atlantic Ocean. 
This eruption that occurred in 2010 was the most notable for the major disruption to both transatlantic and intra-Europe air traffic due to its ash carried by the wind. However, volcanoes can provide some benefit to people by producing geothermal energy to heat houses and power factories, and the ash can fertilize the soil for agricultural purposes. Most human activities are closely linked to weather and climate. Humans need the right temperature and moisture to grow crops for foods and other products. Much of the world's landscape diversity results from ways in which people adapt to weather and climate. This adaptation will continue as climate and weather continues to change through processes such as global warming. The world's climates differ from place to place as they are influenced by these climate controls, solar energy, latitude, land, water interaction, global pressure systems, global wind patterns, and topography. We will look at these factors in the next several slides. The natural warming of the Earth's surface is due to heat from the sun called solar radiation. Solar radiation is the most important factor in the Earth's climate. Solar radiation also is responsible for driving other important processes, including global pressure systems, winds, and ocean currents. So how does all the heat from the sun stay near the Earth's surface? If it weren't for the greenhouse effect, solar radiation would bounce back off into space, causing much colder temperatures than we have now, much like that on Mars. Humans would not be able to live on Earth without the greenhouse effect. The influence of latitude also affects our climate and temperatures. Because of the curvature of the globe, insulation strikes Earth at different angles, which causes a differential in heating of the Earth's surface along the Earth's latitudinal lines. Lat latitudinal lines go north and south from the equator. In other words, solar radiation is more effective at or near the equator than from the higher latitudes towards the poles. Therefore, people experience solar heat more intensely if they were living near the equator than people who are living closer to the poles. This heat is then redistributed away from the tropics through physical processes such as global pressure and wind systems, ocean currents, tropical typhoons, hurricanes, and even mid-latitude storms. The photo shows Hurricane Sandy that devastated the east coast of the United States in 2012. The reason this was a megastorm is that it merged with a mid-latitude system moving across North America. Since land and water absorb and radiate heat differently, this can explain why climates are different at or near coastlines and that of interior lands. Generally, climate inland is called continental, and climate along coastlines is called maritime. Continental weather is usually hot in the summer and very cold and snowy in the winter, while maritime weather has moderate temperatures in both seasons. Uneven heating of the Earth's surface due to latitudinal differences combined with the arrangement of oceans and continents produce a regular pattern of high and low pressure cells that can produce rainstorms when they collide. There are are areas of the world that experience the collision of the two pressure systems more than others. This can explain why there is more rainfall in some areas and very little in others. These pressure systems also act differently in different areas of the globe. High and low pressure systems also produce global wind patterns at local, regional, and global scales. Winds generally flow away from high pressure cells, but flow towards low pressure cells. This explains why India receives monsoons in June as heavy moisture air masses flow northward from high pressure cells over the Indian Ocean to low pressure cells in North India and Tibet. For example, this satellite image shows the summer monsoon in the U.S. southwest. As the U.S. southwest warms in June and July, this heating creates thermal lows that draw in moist air from the Gulf of Mexico and California, resulting in cloudiness, thunderstorms, and much needed rainfall. This photo shows the orographic effect where air rises up and over mountains to produce both wet and dry areas. 
In this process, as air rises up the windward side of the mountain, it produces rainfall and snow due to cooling temperatures at higher elevations, whereas cold air loses its ability to hold moisture. But once the air moves over the mountains, it begins to descend and warm up. Warm air has the ability to hold moisture, therefore leaving the leeward side dry. These dry areas are said to be in the rain shadow of the adjacent mountains. Please pause the video and answer the following. After reviewing the concept of the orographic effect, look at a map of the world and list at least five different areas, including the United States, where rain shadow would be found. This map shows the world's climate regions and a few examples of a climograph. Climographs are graphic representations of monthly average high and low temperatures and monthly precipitation amounts. The climate mapping scheme that you see was devised to show the diversity of the world's climates. The, different, the difference between climate and weather is that climate is a long-term average from daily weather measurements, while weather is the short-term day-to-day expressions of atmospheric processes, like is it raining, cloudy, sunny, hot, windy, or calm. Weather is usually measured hourly each day. In the map, a combination of upper and lower case letters describe the general climate type, along with precipitation and temperature characteristics. Please pause the video, study the map, and answer the following. What is the climate or climates for the following places? Virginia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Australia, and Brazil. Using the text as a guide, be thorough and specific in your answer. Scientists believe that the climate of the Earth has been warming naturally since the last ice age, but today the Earth's climate is warming up at alarming rates. Human-caused or anthropogenic activities are what is causing this change in ways that have a significant impact on all living organisms, specifically pollution caused by burning of fossil fuels and the excessive emissions of the greenhouse gases listed are creating an imbalance in the greenhouse gas effect, which is in turn creating a warmer atmosphere than normal. This accelerated rate of warming, unlike the natural cycles of climate change itself, is referred to as global warming. Global warming can lead to climate changes in such a way that it would change where and how we would produce food. It would also have effects on rising sea levels, therefore creating flooding in low-lying areas, just to name a few. These two graphs show the relationship between the rapid increase in CO2 in the atmosphere and the associated rise in average annual temperatures for the world. Take a look at how far back these graphs go and examine how relatively stable the temperature and CO2 output have been until the recent industrial period began toward the 1900s. There are a few trends happening and tensions caused by those trends throughout the world regarding CO2 emissions and global warming. The graph shows that many of the fully industrialized, more developed countries have stabilized their CO2 emissions and in some cases have reduced them, whereas China and India have steadily increased their output over the last 15 years as they move towards becoming fully industrialized countries. However, what is alarming is the rate at which China is emitting and has no plans to slow down. The Kyoto Protocol Agreement, signed by many countries in 1997, except for China, India, and some other countries, would require CO2 emissions to be reduced by certain milestones and dates. Both China and India believe that under, even under global pressure to stop, they have the right to continue to develop their economies as they see fit. Global energy is another area studied under physical geography and environment. The world runs on energy, which is the capacity to do work. Energy resources are categorized as either non-renewable or renewable. Non-renewable resources are natural resources that are considered finite because they are not self-replenishing or they take a very long time to do so, like fossil fuels and uranium. Fossil fuels are coal, oil, and natural gas that comes from varied remains of plants and animals that lived millions of years ago. Over time, sand and other sediments covered these deposits while heat and pressure gradually transformed them. The top photo depicts a coal burning plant in China. Renewable resources, however, are resources replenished naturally or through human intervention, like planting a tree. 
Renewable resources include water, wind, and the sun. The bottom photo shows a wind farm in California. This chart shows the varied world geography of energy resources, production, and consumption. Because a high degree of uncertainty and technological difficulties involved with fossil fuel mining, the energy industry uses the concept of proven reserves to refer to deposits that are possible to mine and distribute under current economic and technological conditions. Please pause the video, study the chart, and answer the following question. What inferences can you make about China in regards to their proven reserves, production, and consumption? In your own words and using the text as a guide, be thorough and specific in your answer. Hydraulic fracking or, or fracking is the latest technology development in the mining, in the mining of oil and gas. This process fo forces the oil and sh gas out of shale rock deep below the Earth's surface, as shown in the diagram. If fracking proves unsuccessful, then it would dr drastically alter the way we produce and trade these resources. However, fracking comes with environmental challenges. Fracking requires a huge amount of fresh water with the possibilities of polluting local groundwater. It also raises the issues of wastewater disposal, local noise and nuisances, and the possibility of causing more earthquakes in the certain geological structures. In the United States, fracking is a very controversial but is very controversial but could be one of the greatest solutions to self-satisfying the energy needs in the U.S. if the environmental issues are satisfactorily resolved. This would also be true for China and Russia, Russia since they have a large reserve of shale rock as well. The Earth's surface is about 70 percent water, yet water is the scarcest resource in the world and the most vital to human survival. It is really hard to believe that out of all the water we see on our planet, 97% of it is unusual, unusable to humans due to the fact that it's salt water. And of the 3% of fresh water, 70% is basically unreachable in that it is frozen in the polar ice caps and glacial mountains. In addition, groundwater, which equals almost the remaining amount of fresh water, or water found underground, is often difficult to access. Therefore, that leaves less than 1% of the world's water in more accessible surface rivers and lakes. In other words, if the total supply of water, global water is 26 gallons, 0.8 gallons would be fresh water, and only approximately a half a teaspoon is readily available to humans. That's not very much. And to combine that amount with it not being evenly distributed across the globe, that makes water stress high on, resource problem, on the resource problem list. Water stress data is calculated by the amount of fresh water available in relation to current and future population. Water problems also stem from natural global climates that produce wet and dry areas, political controls over river basins, and different economies having different water uses patterns. The map shows where water stress is the greatest. Water planners use the concept of water stress for those regions where water is or will be in short supply because of the combination of high water usage, low water supply, and the forecast population growth of an area. Unfortunately, people use polluted water when fresh water is not available. This leads to high rates of sickness and even deaths. Globally, the rate of illnesses from polluted water is about 50% according to UN reports and most of them are infants and children who have not yet built up the tolerance to the contaminated water. It is also reported that almost 4,000 children die from unsafe water and lack of basic sanitation facilities. In many parts of the world, women and young girls spend much of their day providing water for their homes and villages. For young girls, this task often interferes with their schooling. These women and girls are fetching water in the Punjab region of India. Some recent efforts to help water access have included loans and economic aid to developing countries to encourage the development of private water systems. However, this has proven more problematic to the users due to the privatization of the system. The international engineering firms who upgraded the systems had to recoup their investment, thusly driving the cost up. At Cochabamba, Bolivia, for example, the privatization of the water system in 2000 resulted in a 35% increase in water costs. In response, the people rebelled and rioted, with demonstrations that became tragically violent. 
Eventually, the water system was returned to the public control. However, today, half the city's population is still without reliable water source. Although global vegetation has been greatly modified by clearing the land for agriculture and settlements and by cutting forests for lumber and paper pulp, there is still a recognizable pattern to the world's bioregions, ranging from tropical forests and woodlands to savannas and grasslands to desert and arctic tundra. Each bioregion has its own array of ecosystems containing plants, animals, and insects. Take a look at Latin America. It has some of the most diverse bioregions in the world. Please pause the video, study the map, and answer the following. The tropical rainforests of the world are located in which regions? Also, the deserts of the world are located in which regions as well? And list and describe the bioregion of Fredericksburg, Virginia. In your own words, and using the text as a guide, be thorough and specific in your answer. Let's examine the tropical rainforest in more detail. Tropical rainforests can be found around the equator in the AF climate region. This region has high average annual temperatures, abundant sunlight, and a lot of rainfall occurring throughout the year. With more than 50% of the world's known plant and animal species living in tropical rainforests, that makes the bioregion with the highest biodiversity. These areas unfortunately are not suitable for agriculture because so little sunlight reaches the forest floors. Since the forests are so thick and dense, most of the sunlight only hits these massive treetops, and most of the nutrients found in the soils are, are absorbed by the extensive tree root system. Deforestation has been a huge environmental challenge for our tropical rainforest bioregions. The two hot spots are the Amazonian Basin of South America and the forests of Southeast Asia in countries like Indonesia. Even though we hear more about deforestation in the Amazon, Southeast Asia has been logging at three times the rate of that in the Amazon. Vital to people and our planet's health and well-being, the Amazon is referred to as the lungs of the world. By the rapid removal of these trees, we are destroying habitats and creating global warming at alarming rates. These trees are used mainly for economic means by the insatiable appetite for wood-based products and beef. More recently, tropical forests have been cleared away to make room for palm oil plantations, whereas the demand for palm oil, a popular cooking oil, has increased. Zebu cattle, a South Asian breed suited to the heat of the tropical rainforest, graze on new pasture created by cutting away and burning rainforest vegetation. Burning the vegetation enriches the soil with nutrients stored in the tree's trunks but also adds considerable amounts of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Desertification, which is creation of arid deserts from what was once grasslands, is also another environmental challenge occurring in the world's desert regions. Desertification normally occurs when extensive farming is done in the semi-arid grassland areas. In this photo, a worker builds biological barriers using hay to stabilize sand dunes and prevent desertification in the Tengar Desert, Gansu Province, China, located in the arid northwest, an area is surrounded by the encroaching Tengar and Badain Jar Jaran deserts, and this area is one of the major sources of China's sandstorms. The Chinese government has spent billions of dollars trying to prevent further expansion of the desert by introducing vegetation and planting trees. Commercial logging in Washington's Olympic Peninsula has dramatically reshaped this landscape. Throughout the Pacific Northwest, environmental lobbies, lobbyists have successfully restricted logging to protect habitat for endangered species and recreation.